own also they get a cut that they're not entitled to right and so stewart's frozen because they yeah. uh the Airbnb uh, spies are freezing his <laughs> signal. That's right. Um, so, so here's one of the challenges is, is um, none of this was thought through by the real estate developers. Right. And right. if any of you have ever run uh, an association of owners, uh, you know to get a majority vote on anything, which is what it takes. It takes a uh, three quarters majority vote in a lot right, of these right, cases right. Mm -hmm. uh, to change any of the core covenants of the, uh, the association. Um, so to be in the on-site property manager's rental pool, uh, they all have a standard of, uh, furnishing and things like that. Um, so, you know, first of all, buyer beware, if you're a traveler and you're booking, um, Joe Schmo's unit on Airbnb, if Joe Schmo's self-renting his unit inside a condo hotel, chances are Joe Schmo was kicked out of the association's rental pool for not meeting the standards of the uh, the yeah, rental yeah, pool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So you're you're probably gonna get forty year old furniture, and uh, and you'll have no one to complain to because you rented it from Joe Schmo, not through the on site property manager. Um, and so there's a lot of broken bad core that's almost yeah. undoable. Uh, and some of these, I mean, do you guys, um, back, uh, years ago, there was a developer, who, the developer who built hammock beach and uh, reunion here in Florida. It was a developer named Gin, uh, that, uh, built these massive condo tell resorts had like Cheryl Crow in every weekend doing concerts and things like that. Well, they were for sale. Yeah. And then yeah. as soon as that was done. They stopped subsidizing all the costs to make the resort that awesome and said to the association, you can keep doing this, but your per unit fee is going to be, you know, $40,000 a year because, uh, you know, Cheryl Crow is not cheap. And right. uh, and magically, uh, Ginn then uh, sold the shell of the on-site property management piece because, you know, he made all the money. He made all the money on s developing oh, the land selling the unit at way too yep, much yep, money. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and now the on-site property manager is left being screamed at by the association to keep renting and yet being undermined by anyone who gets kicked out of the association and are you know illegally using the brand name. Because believe it or not, if you own a unit, you actually don't have rights to use the name. Yeah, yeah. But sure, they right, all sure. are. So it's a yeah. messy, Condotel is in a really messy place. And so the new ones being built um, have sharper attorneys on them right, that understand right. all of this. Right. And so now there are the newer units are, you know, being sold with association well, is, rules that understand, uh, and, and, you know, basically forbid you from selling the unit yourself, uh, or renting the unit yourself. Um, so well, this is the, this is the same kind of problem. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, to, to broaden this to digital and things along those lines more broadly. You know, this is the same thing that um, media companies went through 10 years ago with mm -hmm. digital rights and streaming rights and things like that, where, where if you were an actor or you were a musician or you were whatever, and, you know, your contract called for what happened when somebody bought the CD, when somebody bought the DVD, when somebody rented the VHS cassette. Oh, but they want to stream it on, on you know, Amazon or they want to... <laughs> Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or free. these days, you want to stream it on Spotify. Which, to be fair, this, they worked all through this before Spotify existed. But the concept is the same. The contract simply didn't didn't envision what kinds of distribution would exist. So it, that's what this problem is. And you're, you're, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. So in ten years, this isn't going to be a problem because the new agreements will have taken care of this. But the old right. agreements that still that still the exist. The difference is, is you're you're talking about someone whose core livelihood required them to have to Oof. renegotiate their contract. Whereas Joe Schmo, who owns a vacation rental unit. No, oh, completely uh, understood. No, I get, right. that. I get that. You're, you're, it's the, the money at stake is much smaller. Yep. And yep. Yep. it's a, a less sophisticated, less motivated uh, party course. that you of need course. to get to come to the table. So I don't know if you're going to see it ever be completely solved uh, on the uh, the sure. old. The sure. ex everything that exists today sure. is incredibly hard to change. Sure. Everything moving forward, I think you'll see, uh, you know, a, a lot of this foresight built in. And then even, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what could happen next as thoughtfulness. But again, 
back when a lot of these were built, it's a real estate developer who went, hmm, I can only justify X dollars a unit if I sell this as a place to live. Yeah, yeah, if I yeah. sell this to UK right. travelers, I can get triple. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to build this rental thing and make them think that, yeah, it's possible to get a $400 ADR in Orlando. Right, um, right, right. You know, and and that will justify selling this uh, 1,200 square foot unit for $300,000, where you literally could go buy a house down the street yeah. for less than that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it makes, it makes a ton well, of sense. I, I have to jump in here on behalf of the other polite female who has joined the group because <laughs> I think she actually had something to say, and I, I would love to hear her thoughts. But she's being too polite. Don't be polite. Your microphone don't, might don't be, be polite. Don't be polite successful. in this room, Stephanie, Stephanie by all means. Yes. Your microphone oh, may be off, you're, though, you're still Your microphone is still off, uh, Stephanie. All right. Happy yeah, Friday. Howdy, howdy. Happy Friday. Friday. No, I... I'm ready to move on to the next topic when you guys are, but uh, it's interesting topic so far. <laughs> Do you want to pick the next topic since you're you're the newest to the show today? You guys put me in this situation last week and um, gave me a hard time for being uh, efficient, so I <laughs> didn't uh, knock them out. Oh no, we're not going to be efficient. That's you you have to realize roll. none of the others none of the others have read any of the articles. They've only seen That's the headlines. Untrue. <laughs> untrue. Well, if we get bored, I'd have an art, a, a topic I'd love to cover today. But and, no and several, of, actually, article. several of them can't even read, but we won't go. We won't detail that. <laughs> All right, that's so true. These are just full for disclosure. Show. I had Siri read them to me. Oh, okay, okay, you caught me. Okay, Robert. okay. <laughs> so, Stephanie, which topic did you want to discuss? Uh, well, as the resident brand expert, I wanted to look at the development pipeline that they put out. Oh, um, yeah. There was a, uh, this is something I kind of like to keep an eye on, um, but this one was a little bit better. Uh, probably about six months ago, there was an article came out that showed about a 7% year over year increase in development pipeline. And this one's um, quoting closer to eight. But, you know, as we look at the different brand profiles and, you know, with Marriott taking over Starwood, I was kind of surprised to see which brands were still gaining traction within or had the most amount of traction in terms of development pipeline. I mean, there was still like a fair amount of Fairfield Inns that are being developed, which um, I'm kind of surprised because I feel like those already exist in most markets. Um, there was a lot of extended stay um, that whether it be home to or some of the Marriott extended stay that seemed to, I think, see a trend in terms of just um, extended stay business. Um, so I was, but I feel like part of that's just because they have, they don't have enough, they already have all the other brands in the market. So you have to do the ones that you don't have. So, um, but I didn't see, and Robert, correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't see if this was just a U.S. Um, report or if it kind of broke down. Um, I, I think it's the U.S. Um, construction pipeline. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I, I have to say, though, to me, the just looking at the title of this article, it kind of came across like McDonald's and Burger King are selling more burgers than anything else on their menu. Like I kind of expect <clears throat> the three major brands to have the most development in the pipeline, um, but still interesting. Some of the, the commentary within the article. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I think it's also something I try to remind us of when we talk about brands, when we're talking about the perception of the moves they make is, you know, always try to remember that the majority of Marriott's are select service or extended stay, not a full service Marriott. The majority of Hilton's are Hampton Inns or Homewood Suites or Home Two Suites. Um, you know, that's that's what's being built. That's what's growing. Uh, that's what makes up the majority of their room count uh, and their unit count. And so, you know, they, but yet they market themselves as uh, feeling luxury, things like that, uh, which I always find funny because I think it's a it's a bit of um, uh, multiple personality disorder in the marketing that Hilton and Marriott sometimes have uh, where they tend to Hilton. I always look at their marketing and, and it matches their biggest boxes. You know, it, it, it matches Hawaiian Village, it matches uh, the Waldorfs, it matches uh, uh, the New York Hilton Midtown, but it does not at all really match a Hampton Inn. Um, and, and I find that funny because Hampton Inn is probably, I mean, now that Hilton doesn't own those properties, it, it 
Hampton Inn probably is the largest source of revenue for Hilton. It's certainly yeah, what the strongest right. brand, especially as they start. If you look at the True and Home Two in terms of the development pipeline, they haven't gained consumer traction yet from the you know in terms of just brand recognition for sure. Um, well, and I thought that was interesting. In the article True has almost as many properties as Hampton Inn, and that's true. You know, you have saturation, uh -huh. you know, market saturation uh -huh. for Hampton, but they've got the same. Yeah. You know, They've got 300 projects and, and about the same number of rooms. And then the other one, which I was avid for IHG with 182 properties, that's that's a pretty good size hockey stick for the IHG guys with that, uh, with that brand. And again, they've got enough Holiday Inn Expresses and Holiday Inns everywhere. But uh, I don't think I think most consumers have never heard of Avid, probably. I would be I'd be uh, interested in in understanding in this research of this pipeline. How many are real estate investment trusts? Well, oh, I think yeah. versus hoteliers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. think the other thing that'll happen just as you know the economy changes, this doesn't go into you know like at what point in this development process are there? Like a lot of these hotels probably don't have the financing yet, so you know how if and when that project will come to fruition um, is you know to be to be told because I know that's the the larger part of it. So you can have a franchise agreement and then not have your financing. So Yeah. I also yeah. I also will admit I'm gonna I'm gonna go to bat for my old friends at Wyndham for a second. I don't know why Wyndham never gets any play in this stuff. Like they they must their investor relations people must have pissed off the street or, <laughs> or pissed off whoever writes this stuff up. You know, in their third quarter release so I'm ex Wyndham, Stephanie, I don't know if you know that, but I'm I've worked at Wyndham for a long time. Um they're the biggest hotel in the company in the world by hotel count. They've got 9,200 hotels, and their pipeline at the moment is 1,450 hotels and 190,000 rooms. So in property count, and it's exactly what Ed was talking about before, it's select service, right? I mean, these are economy and select service brands. Um, but they actually have more hotels in the pipeline than anybody else. The thing is, the room count per hotel is a lot lower than what the average Marriott is or the average Hilton Well. Is. And I don't. And I thing, never understand why they don't get enough press about the fact that what they are, percentage, by a measure, the biggest hotel company in the world. Yeah. But what percentage of that pipeline is actual new build versus conversion for for the Wyndham brand? Because Wyndham, uh, that's a, a lot point. of those that's brands. Point. Yeah, that's true. We're talking construction on this side, so that's right. That's a very so, fair point. you know, uh, so all I'm going to go out on a limb and say 95 percent of it is conversion. Wow. Right? I, yeah. Yeah. I'm probably joking, uh, well, Wingates, but, Wingates but, were, but a were, lot of it is. Yeah, but Wingates, don't forget, Wingates, our last number I knew was about 150 properties. Yeah. So out of 9,200, 150 is, let me do the math, not much. They still that low, really. <laughs> uh, Wingate was, Wingate's a pretty solid brand. I don't know. Well, I thought they had more. It's interesting because, you know, you're saying, like you said, Ed, that a lot of these major brands that we tend to think of as full service are in reality developing all mid-scale properties oh, yeah. or mid-scale properties. But I have long thought that IHG is trying to position themselves as more of a luxury brand um, yeah. with their moves to take on Kimpton and their move to take on, I think it was Seven Seas Six, they purchased as well. And so the article today about their digital um, kind of distribution was interesting to me because did you see who they hired to head it up? Someone from Mandarin Oriental. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it yeah. was interesting. Yeah, but it wasn't it, a long-term Mandarin their, person, right? Their yeah. attribute-based selling, which is you know the thing they're trying to work into every single uh, oh, release barf. that they have. Excuse me for um, a second while I go throw up. <laughs> doesn't even apply to the majority of their hotel count. Correct. Uh, right. Because a Holiday Inn Express doesn't have many attributes to sell. A Holiday Inn. Oh, if you'd like a have... coffee, if you'd like I, a coffee maker. I got to get, <laughs> yeah. get in on this because uh, that concerto, I was actually on the uh, IHGO's association for a number of years that kind of helped with that. But just to give like a little bit of insight into that, it's, it is attribute selling, but hopefully they'll get to a place where, there's better inventory control as it relates to the, you know, with the OTAs. There's so much more involved than just attribute selling, um, you know, and just being able to either sell add-ons better in that selling process um, and then just get away from an archaic doll space uh, reservation. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> um, by the way, by the way, my, my, my reaction is not about 
upselling is not about having a better system. It's about people, the people use the word attribute based selling to cover a multitude Oof. of sins. And we tend to be putting carts in front of horses on some of this, you know? Oh yeah. There's that's, a lot. That's going to be You're exactly right, problem. Stephanie. There's a lot of opportunity. I completely agree. There's a ton of opportunity to improve the upselling uh, uh, experience. There's a lot of opportunity to uh, improve the ancillary revenue experience. So all yeah. of that is absolutely true. And just in terms of integration of systems, you know, previously yeah. your your PMS, your reservation system, your meeting planner, your meetings system, your POS, all were basically run as siloed systems. So if you can create a better a better core and have better interactions and in layering those systems, so that yeah. from a revenue management standpoint, everything talks to talks to each other a lot better. I feel like there's a much greater opportunity for more holistic revenue management, but, you know, and revenue generation across all platforms. Yeah, right. Yeah. But here's here's the fallacy of how and, and I'm not opposed, certainly not opposed to attribute based selling as a Nor concept. And, and in many cases, the industry does do it through room categories and room types and things like that, right, where they they bundle these up. But uh, I'll pick on Shiji, for example, because, again, these attribute based selling is being predominantly pushed by three groups, Shiji, Amadeus, and Sabre, because they're trying to sell new reservation systems that do, yeah. right? Yeah, that, exactly. that is the underlying yeah, uh, purpose of this. But Shiji, in the first article, I think that really kind of you know came out with this, dis distru distributable, that's a mouthful, hotel attributes. Their examples were meeting spaces, 15 euros, rooftop bar, 25 euros sea view 20 euros king size bed 50 euros well those already kind of happen um, tennis court 15 euros swimming pool 50 euros restaurant 10 euros golf course 15 euros parking 10 euros okay parking's kind of you know and and self check-in you go those are ridiculous examples right aside from the existing sea view bed types you know those sorts of things those are separate facilities to cross sell but not really part of the, i think uh, there's better part. examples to use than those though you could say oh, yeah. you know, whether i think a huge um opportunity for hotels is charging for early check-in and late checkout on sure. a, you sure. know things like sure. that right now we don't really yep. have very good capabilities to do that automatically without having to manually integrate with the front desk Right. Um, but right. to your point right. about um, Amadeus, I mean, Amadeus, you look at every air, what they did with the airline industry, every airline uses the same um, reservation system. And it's how, you know, the Southwest and the you know American Airlines build on top of that. So there is an opportunity from a community model for to basically get rid of the marshes of the world to have that same. It's how you sell the systems on top of it. That was what Amadeus is trying to do for the hotels that they did for the airline industry. Right. Ab absolutely. And yeah. again, the, the a major challenge with with all of this is, again, it's it's like the resort fee. This isn't attribute based selling. This is bundling, right, and packaging. Because there are five. Well, well no, that's well, not no, necessarily again, true. No, no there are five types. True. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to hear on, my Robert. definition of pack packaging, though. Yeah, I know, but. <laughs> But he doesn't want to. But I'm going to so. disagree at the end anyway. I was just trying to cut to the chase. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's from – when That's I think right, about hey. early check-in and late check-out and things along those lines, you know, one of the things that I have found to be true for years and, – and, I mean, if somebody has a different experience on this, please say so. But, you know, the thing you have to do is sell the room first. When we talk about things like early check-in and late check-out, you want folks to know that it is available – and it right. makes a great upsell. It makes a great thing to sell after you got them to agree. Yeah, this is the room I want. This is the property I want. This is the destination I want. And actually flip those around, right? Destination, property, room. Um, but then all those other attributes become things that are upsell opportunities of, right. hey, will you pay us an extra this for this? Will you pay us an extra that for that? You know, it it tends to work better in terms of how the guest thinks about how they are looking for what matters to them during their stay. They want to know that those things are available, but also a lot of the things that people have been talking about as attributes, apart from the obvious, you know, Hey, give me a better view. Give me a better room. Uh, give me a, a late check in, late check out, things like that. You know, there's not as many levers to play with as I think we'd like to think there are sometimes, you know? Yeah, and, right. and I think so the I danger is, 
that you can go the other way, right? I, I was listening to a podcast this week where Amadeus were talking about NDC and they were talking about how what they've done for the airline industry and how they want to do the same with attribution modeling in, in hotels. And um, one of the examples was brought up was, well, does everyone need an iron in their room? Does everyone need an ironing board? Does everyone yeah. need a coffee pot? That's where I think we're going to go down a slippery slope to Correct. reducing Absolutely. the experience of the guest, right? Because Correct. I just, I'm not going to use the iron every time I'm in a hotel, but every time I want to use an iron in a hotel, I want it to be there. I don't want to have to have the hassle of choosing whether it's there or not. So I think as long as it's yeah, for appropriately sure. as attributions that are adding to the experience, not looking at a way to strip away from the current experience to monetize what they're already getting, like the airline industry is, I think we're okay. But you know, Mike, I'm not very confident the industry as a whole is going to treat this the way, no. you know, in that spirit. That's I don't think we're going down that route. Tim, Tim, no. Just because I want to make sure that you don't get to get away with like thinking you're right, I'm going to tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, and then I will too. So, in, uh, in, in major international destinations uh, mm -hmm. that tend to have the flights drop you early in the morning, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of those no, consumers true. would enjoy early check in or late checkout um, to know absolutely that they haven't true. locked down early. They actually may I'm pay one of those an guys a lot of premium. times. I absolutely agree right. with that. So, uh, you know, so I wanted to disagree with you on that. The other thing I wanted to throw out as a caution on the attribution based selling is already hotel product is way too complicated for what it is. Right. And it's poorly displayed to the consumer because we always forget not all consumers, most consumers don't travel as much as all of us That's do. Right. And I'll give you a perfect example of it. And I don't want to pick on Synexus, Sabre, because actually overall they've been a really good architecture through their time. But they offer to hotels the ability to lead off with rate plan versus room type in the, uh, in the consumer journey, which is asinine because consumers don't know what rate plans are. The average traveler doesn't know what a rate plan is. And oh, by the way, there's nothing more frustrating than pick a rate plan and then finding out there's no uh, attributed room categories available to that rate plan. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's a huge flaw in, uh, going over complicated is in a lot of cases, you're going to run into, uh, uh, these, these kind of pit, uh, these, these friction points for the consumer. If we over complicate the product and the positioning of the product. So this is where I will, even though I said Tim's wrong, I will actually say that, uh, selling after the initial sale. Uh, is is more consumer friendly and actually removes some of the friction of the first decision. Um, you it know, depends and, and that what it is though, right? It depends right. what it is yeah. you're selling. Yeah. Like for example, right. you know, we've done a lot of testing on our booking engine because there's a there's a step you can include between the selecting a room and rate plan and so and checking out and that is an additional service module you sure. don't have to have it it's an option but things like add on breakfast when you're dealing with a family vacation travel at that point so it's all taken care of yeah. that has a positive impact on conversion rate and revenue Absolutely. right so of i think course. it depends on what attribute you're you're adding and and not obviously not giving too much choice so there's a paradox so, you know it oh, just right. creates this um like just complete freezing of decision making but uh, Depending on the on the attribute, I think you can sell it before. But the majority of things, I think, should be sold afterwards. Well, I do think if it's freezing, yeah. honestly, it's a big problem right now because, I mean, it, if you've ever been to our friends at Applebee's, uh, you know that it's a little difficult to choose anything to eat. And, it like, I just recently went to a, um Italian restaurant, uh, affectionately called Balls, and they actually <laughs> would allow you to choose any base and then any, you know, sauce yeah. and then like six different types of meatballs. And whenever I get into those scenarios, it's almost like there's too many good options and it is yep. sort of paralyzing. Like we yeah. need to yeah, provide right. options, but a limited number of really targeted options, I think, in order for any right. of this to make any sense. And, and going a really back good to, user experience, like a right, really well-designed serving absolutely. of it, which is why, like, that's my big caveat for all of this. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, Amadeus, uh, well, they've built some great core infrastructure, uh, their consumer facing stuff is in line with everyone else in the hotel industry, which is, right. you know, piss poor. Uh, yeah, sure. compared to many other industries that design user experiences. 
Yeah, I, I, I actually argued there UI like, is worse than a lot of folks. It's it's archaic, especially on mobile. Yeah, I was being I nice. Think also, yeah. we need to come back to the conversation about you know I don't see early check in or late checkout as an attribute. I see it as you know we're looking at selling now rooms by hour increments, not by night increments. Funny how we got yes. back to that. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it really. Um, but really, you know, if you can book a room from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that should be a different rate than if you book a room from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. the following day. And sure, that's the rental car companies where, do it. Right. Are, are currently, and I wouldn't even do it by the rental car companies. You know, I would do it as an hourly increment. I think that's where we need to go in revenue management, where there is actually a multiplier, whether or not it's published as an hourly rate or not is immaterial. It's really a matter of, you know, you select your check-in time, you select your checkout time, sure, and you can sure. say this, and then maybe you have sort of a run of house check-in time that's yeah. based on the typical, if you're not sure what time you're going to arrive and you leave it to chance a little bit. There, there are a lot of housekeeping okay. folks or operations folks that have to deal with housekeeping that are having heart attacks right now when you say Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Because the logistics you know of that, it, it, like <laughs> right. mind boggling. But the logistics would be helpful actually, because right now yeah. you don't know, you know when, when, when the guests are, are gonna arrive. randomly show up early. Right. So well, you're scheduling, you instead of scheduling inventory, all right? your housekeepers, yeah. I don't think you do because instead of scheduling all your housekeepers from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. like we do right now and maybe 1 p.m. person, you would actually run an arrivals and departures list that is more right, But you've got to limit where, you know where, the, you know, where the overlap is, right? Because right. If, if you get too many people want late checkout and early check-in, then it's physically Lily just dropped impossible. the mic and said the hell with you. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Lily's like, forget you, Stuart. Nothing yeah. you say matters. Well, I mean, there's already a shortage of staff on the housekeeping side. It's already hard enough to turn over yeah. when everyone checks out by 11 and no one checks in until 3 or 4, right? That's already right. a nightmare. I think your point so, is if we could do staggered, if you could do more staggered based ooh. on the data that you as have. Long as so even in New York, I mean, so let's let's go, let's go, let's hold on, hold on, hold on, this, hold on. Let's actually if finish you, what you were saying. Stephanie, if you actually ahead. placed people in rooms by their check-in, check-out times, you would allow the housekeeping staff to move as like a sweeping motion throughout. That would actually create a lot of As efficiency. long as they're not too close together, right? Because you, now right. the PMS is aren't built to, to deal with that. There, there's already a daily shuffle that has to happen of who's checking in and checking out. Overnight. Now you're doing it by the hour. There's not a system in the planet that would allow you to do that so, seamlessly. Well, there are the, programs out there like b that do sell. You can you put your, you dump your inventory, your half day inventory for those airline travelers and things like that. It's, there are systems out there that, you know, it's, but it's a minority, it's right? It's a, it's a, it's a hand, but then you get, you know, that room's completely unoccupied except for those minority of people that come through that one channel. When you're talking about like a 5,000 unit property and you're dealing with the logistics of that, I just, the air traffic control alone would be insane. There's not a system out there to track it. Right. There's no uh, system out there that allows for you to book a room with a certain arrival and departure time either. Right. I mean, I think right. we're the the whole problem right now is technology. That's why it can't PMS be done with our existing PMS technology and our existing CRS technology. But theoretically, if somebody were to build a system to allow for this, then they would have the analytics and the reporting to do it. I mean, we can't assume that we're going to use the same reporting with a brand new system that we always have. Right. Um, if we can build a BI tool, if OTA Insight can build this Revenue Insight tool that plugs in and tells me my entire pace by every metric possible with no need to look at history, I think that capability is out there. It's just a matter of reimagining the reports and doing things in a new way that we mm -hmm. we haven't done well, before. And, and There's building one other a new property aspect, management system. You need a new property management system and you have to be very careful how you design your, your room categories because otherwise you get into a situation where, yes, it's attribute-based selling. You've now broken down much more finite groups, right? You're saying it's the partial, the high floor partial ocean view king or something like that. And you may only have a few of those rooms, right? You have five or 10 because you're trying to really optimize everything. But then all of a sudden, your whole inventory management approach better be a damn good Tetris player, 
right? Yeah. They, you got to so, go find some, some guys who were absolute world class with Tetris because you're going to kill yourself because you don't, you need that continuity of that room available. If it's a seven night stay, that particular unit has to be available all seven nights, right? Only and that's if, on only if, if you continue. You software to yeah. do that. No. <laughs> so nobody has it yet, right? Because that's only true if you continue to sell by room type. Now, if you do a filter, it's worse and if you, you do it by unit. <laughs> no, it's it's great because you don't list the units. You just say what kind of room do you want. You filter down by the attributes you want, and then it offers you up a couple of suggestions that meet your okay. criteria. So have, that have way, you this, right, have you operated a hotel like this before in in real life? No, because the technology okay. doesn't exist for it. Okay. No, I, actually, I, I, actually, I, I take that back. I, have. I take that I have. back. I have okay. done that. I have. Okay. Um, we have an eight-room property in Mexico right now, and okay. every individual room is a room type. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so when I was at, when I was at leading, we had this was a thing we dealt with all the time from that perspective. In my leading experience, we had four hundred fifty properties. We had we had eight uh, unit you know, safari camps where mm -hmm. every single, every single um, campsite was a different room type because they were all configured. No, seriously. Right. Yeah. No, had, I'm laughing at the had... comments in the, uh, in the oh, comment section. I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't but, seen the comments. But your safari camps have normally consistent arrival departure patterns, right? Normally, some of them go anytime you want to come in, but they, they wind up structuring that because they have huge problems. If you have a, a four-day safari coming into a three-day, or they'll break it down with you know two different safaris per week or whatever, you know, short or long. Um, All-inclusive resorts used to do that a lot, but if you wind up doing that, if you have a four a, a two-day stay, a two-day gap, and then you know a three-day stay, you've got to find a two-day stay to fit into that room. Oh, absolutely. Is, and, and I worked with Hotel Seoginza in Tokyo. I used to handle their marketing. 80-room um, ultra-luxury, six-star yep. property. 80 um, rooms, 45 room types. It's one of the most inefficiently – and they, they were doing it for all the right reasons. They Correct. threw they people did it to take care of the, at yeah. these unbelievable yep. level of detail, and they killed themselves because they didn't have control over the customer demand. Right. And to, because to they really didn't use AI. The, no, AI has nothing to no, do with it. They, they used the form of AI. It was actual intelligence. It was, it was real. Robert. It was human intelligence. But if you've got to narrow down, like if we're in this theory where every room is its own unit, right? Let's say we're talking about a 250-room hotel, kind of the average mid-size uh, full-service hotel, then AI can help determine which rooms to offer up based on probabilities of whether or not you're gonna be able to fill this hole and really position the guests where you want them because theoretically, right. unless you're almost sold out, there's gonna be multiple rooms that are going to meet the guest criteria and you don't want a list of 50 rooms. If Boy, once, you're over, once you're over 90%, having been a, a rooms division manager in Yellowstone National Park, which was 600 rooms with a 1.8 Oh, eight day length of stay. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. You you want. But you can fill all your holes. Yes, in that case, we could, <laughs> we could fill the holes. Robert's always been but, able to. Oh, but the, oh, with pizza. That's right. <laughs> but the problem is that the this is an operational nightmare from a strategic a strategic perspective for the uh, hotels and AI doesn't AI doesn't fix it because what happens is the AI is looking at all the patterns and what's happened and they go we've got a hole we now have to lower the pricing to fill this right because we need to find someone to come in here and you start artificially doing things and you're it's it's not going to be a creative so, to profitability to be fair she to, said theoretically and it would be great if you could head in this direction but a lot of things would, would need to change of course um, yeah, Which, of course. I mean, so and I'm not talking is, pricing either. I'm talking room assignment. If you want to start assignment. today down that path, the first thing you'll have to do is make sure that all of your data is in excellent shape right. and is right. kept really well. Because without oh well, then that problem's data, already solved. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's why all of, data, of my of uh, possible. 
Yeah, that's, that's always my first step whenever people say, you know, how do we go into total revenue management? How do we do this? And I'm like, first, you create a data cleanliness program because I guarantee you, your data is not clean today. And that is an excellent point. I mean, we really, uh, if we want the industry to advance, we have to take care of some of these basics because it's like building the foundation, right? Like if you don't have a good foundation, you're going to have a crappy building and it's no different in scenarios like this. But I do think, Robert, that, you know, your your concerns about this are, in my mind, predicated on doing things in a way that we're doing them now. So you've got to kind of take yeah. that out of out of the equation to some degree, because if the technology existed, then I think that we we have enough great minds out there in development of technology that if somebody wanted to make the investment, it could be done. The real question is. Who wants to make that investment? Well, no. Well, you, you, you have a rules-based. All you do is you develop a, a, a rules-based PMS, right? And you can do that, and that's and that's fine because you don't need. And for for decades, there are logical, you know, logical room configurations and, and inventory structures versus physical ones, right? So yeah, you you can do all of that. It's I equate this to the hotel industry is out there going. Leopard kittens are so cute. Let's bring one home, <laughs> right? There are going to be a lot of issues. Not going to disagree. The yeah, of course. Kittens are cute. Not going to be well. Yeah, they are. They are. Cute. Okay, but but just think back many many years because this is the exact type. I was of there. Thing, Robert, this is the exact now. type of thing that I heard when we said. You cannot have a rate sheet at the front desk for the year that you hand out to your guests. You need to flex your pricing by day of week and demand. And people were freaked out by that and talked about all the challenges that they were going to be. Right. Well, that was they, uh, in the you've been trying to get a word in edgewise. Hold that on was, a second. Stephanie, was you've been trying to get a word in edgewise. Hey, yeah. Robert, stop being aggressive. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, you've been trying to get a word <laughs> I, in edgewise. I just want to throw it out there as a question from a, okay, if you think about, just as comparison to the airline industry and you have your spirits and frontiers of the world that have positioned themselves as um, the cheap provider that can, you know, get this base thing. Like from, if you translate that into the hotel space, is there an opportunity to look at those more basic systems or even within a brand or a portfolio of IEC or Hilton hotels to say, you know, we're going to not have attributes or we're going to have a baseline room so that, you know, positioning standpoint, there's no decisions, no, just the cheapest room. And here's, yeah. a room and, you know, and just know so that. I have, I have two answers for this. And the first answer is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, if you look at motel six and super eight, that's how they started, right? Motel sure. uh, super, super eight was $8 and 88 cents every single night, every day of the week. That was, that was the way it started. You could absolutely do this again. And I think there are opportunities for people to own that base service. And I think you're seeing that, to some degree with folks like pod hotel or the like again i think they're still pricing a little more uh, variable but the idea is is very simple is very similar in terms of simplifying the product offering simplifying the pricing making it more straightforward um i'm going to be a little snarky for one second but that's just because Please. i tend to roll that it. way sometimes that's the best you know, kind <laughs> i would not necessarily in the hospitality industry say we want to do anything that mirrors spirit or frontier because i <laughs> <laughs> but but in terms of yes, can you offer a basic product at a basic uh, uh, at a basic price? Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for that in the marketplace. Because that's what that's the, what Drew was supposed to be for Hilton. They were supposed to be from a development yeah, standpoint, yeah. a low cost per key. But even with the ones I work with, they've taken on you know because you can't keep your development costs in line. Therefore, you have to be more yeah. aggressive on the rate, and that wasn't supposed to be the price point and deliverable right. model in terms of basic right. hotel lack of amenities and things like that by, on, a, on a larger scale. By the way, since we were talking about them before, uh, I did look, Wingate Inns, and I, I, I'm bringing them back into the conversation for a specific reason. They have 170 properties, uh, I looked, um, wow. and that actually has been, <coughs> excuse me, been their model for years and years and years is everything's included. Um, you know, it's designed for a business traveler. It's designed to be easy, right? Um, and they... They actually do tend to follow that model um, still pretty closely. Of it's a it's a simple product, um, and they don't have a lot of add-ons. And they you know 
they're priced by market, obviously. But uh, it's a pretty straightforward product. By the way, quick I also everyone, did look, pick a topic. I also Robert did look. Tom. I also did look <laughs> since I was since I was fact checking myself. Uh, Wyndham's pipeline of uh, fourteen hundred and fifty uh, hotels and one hundred ninety thousand rooms. Uh, they said seventy four percent of that is new construction. So I was way wow. off in my numbers really? in terms of way way off in terms of new construction. Since you fact check, check a core too. That was the other one I didn't that should be. Oh yeah, you'd, <laughs> you'd think you'd see a core in kinda, there for sure. Kind of big. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but since I was fact checking, I wanted to be clear on that. And Robert, I don't know if you heard, but uh, Wyndham says that their development pipeline, 74% is new construction. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Surpri it surprised me. They, Historically, well, no, they've done a that, lot of conversions. Yeah. Historically, a right. lot of their properties. Well, and they've got Oyo. Oyo's pulling a lot of those conversions out and others. We'll see how long uh, that well, lasts. Well, let's, let's, be fair, <laughs> let's be fair about that. The, pro the product that Oyo is converting these days, Wyndham hasn't been touching oh, that's true. in Knights large in, numbers for that's years. That's true. Knights in, Knights in is, is now Knights Red Lion's. In. <laughs> Knights in's Red Lion's problem. And, uh, and we saw CEO. how well that worked out for Red Lion. Yeah, the new CEO of Red Lion will have to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we seem to I was have just petered off at... on this topic. Do we want to pick another one to yeah, just try so. and squeeze another one in? <laughs> yep. All right. So, uh, Stuart, I'm going to jump all over you. Over so, barring Baby Yoda, what else would you like to talk about? <laughs> uh, that's a spoiler, by the way. Uh, but, dude, yeah. I haven't watched it yet. Come on, man. Watch what? <laughs> cool. Exactly. What am I even talking about? Yeah, unfortunately, um, I know what you're talking about because the internet sucks. I'd, I'd like to talk about the Google <laughs> um, local algorithm update. It's getting a little nerdy, but but I think it's there's yeah. a life, there's a lesson here that w repeats itself every single time any update ever happens to Google, where everyone freaks out, knee jerk reaction, tries to change a bunch of stuff to game the system, then realizes, oh shit, that didn't work. It actually hurt <laughs> me. I should have stuck with my original strategy. But yeah. ba basically, Google's come out with a, with another kind of big shake up to their local algorithm and a lot of folks in across different industries are seeing a big drop in their ranking and and you know I think we could debate whether ranking is something you should even be focused on right now but the the nuts of it are that it looks like what Google's doing is playing paying even more attention to your vicinity to the local business in, right. in terms of deciding what it's going to serve you. So if I'm in an Austin, Texas, then it's literally going to look at where I am in Austin, Texas. And if I search for hotels in Austin, the ones that are in my real nearby vicinity are the ones that are more likely to show up, right? Which is great for a consumer. That's the exact right thing that it should be doing from a consumer perspective. But now people are doing what they always do and having hissy fits about it, which is which is funny to me. Well, actually, if we can say one thing about this that has been a mantra of mine for a long time is we we discovered, so we did a bunch of usability research in my Wyndham days um, where, especially for economy and mid-scale product, um, we didn't talk about location. We didn't talk about, you know, distance. We talked about proximity, mm -hmm. right? People really tend to care. They don't just want you to be somewhere in the vicinity of, they want you to be right next door. Next door yeah. They want you to be mm -hmm. right across the street from, you know, my favorite thing I ever saw, it was one guy uh, who we saw in a usability lab. Um, um, but he said out loud what we witnessed with literally like 20 other people, uh, like 20 people in a row, right? But this guy said it out loud. He was looking at uh, Hotel Circle in uh, San Diego, right? And there was a property at one end of Hotel Circle, and there was a property at the other end of Hotel Circle. And the difference in rate was like five bucks or 10 bucks. And, and by the way, these were rates that were like $79 a night, just to put this in context, right? So it was 79 bucks a night, $69 a night at opposite ends of Hotel Circle. And he looked at the first property. It's like, I don't know, that's a little expensive. The one that was at the one end of Hotel Circle. He's like, it's a little expensive, but it's not, you know, it's okay, but I really like where it is, right? Then he looked at the one at the other end of Hotel Circle that was $69, and he said, oh, that price is great, but man, it's in the middle of nowhere. You know, for 10 bucks, <laughs> I think I'd rather be where everything is. Mm -hmm. We're talking a mile apart if that. <laughs> and it was the middle of nowhere to mm -hmm. this guy, you know. 
a convenience proximity. is the thing. It's, I'm sorry? You know, yeah, whether it's, yeah. whether it's proximity or anything else. That's right. What people are buying today is convenience. And that ties back into so many other things we've already talked about with attribute-based selling and stuff like that. Not having too many offers is not convenient. Right. So you have to make the whole experience convenient. Well, my, 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 my term for this that I've used for a long time are P's and Q's. People care about four things in hotels, which is uh, price, proximity, uh, qualities, which is how I sum up a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, the, the amenities and things like that and quality, right? You know, it's, yeah. it's, and if you got those four things and if you think about it like a Venn diagram, different people are going to prioritize different ones of those based on the nature of their trip. But they're sure. making a decision based on those four attributes, those four components. I won't use the word attributes in this case. And what's interesting well, is this with like <laughs> ride sharing and things like that. Now, I wonder if the uh, the circles have changed. So oh, they probably now, they have for those guests who care about but, that. But for other guests, but it actually won't. could be challenging because if you think about it, if you were just on the edge of what would be considered walking distance to something, is that actually worse now because you can't? you know, grab easily a lot of ride sharing that short of a distance. Yeah, uh, so, you know, is the ring now darker further out uh, and actually gets, gets this like light mark where people know that they're just going to have a hard time getting a ride, but it's really kind of too far to walk. And then it goes back to location, location, location. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see the impact of those types of things on uh, the overall, uh, how someone looks at proximity. Yeah, yeah, we, well, we found. Proxy, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, that's what people trying to figure out is they're trying to make that make give it serve it up to you on a silver platter so that you don't have to do so much legwork. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, but the dang interesting it, thing, I'm outside the circle. How do I get in the circle? But for a lot of economy lodging, like if you look at say, like you know a Toronto or something like that, where they can't afford to stay downtown, all of a sudden, you know, Yes, you've got a lake on one side, so it's a little bit easier, right? You've got this kind of 180 degree spectrum and people will wind up, they want to stay on the west side, but it isn't available or whatever. They'll stay 30 miles away on the east side of the city. And it's the same thing. Right, because you have well, they run. they will if the other factors outweigh them. Right, it depends. It depends, it on, depends the factors, on the depends on the traveler. Those... It depends on the trip. I mean, yeah, it, well, but if they can't, if they can't afford a hotel, things like that. Well, that's but, the quality well, that I was talking about before. Right. Yeah, but the but the interesting thing on the proximity is yes, they want to be in Toronto, but they need to be accessible to some sort of transportation. Yeah, you know, and maybe it is ride sharing. Or it's you know, a, a subway stop or yeah, something like that where they, can, where they can get to where they want to, to be, which, be, again, you know, we've talked a lot on the show about these demand drivers being you know, sporting events or concerts or all the things that attract. Those are all different dimensions, these little sub-segments, which really are important over particular weekends or well, weeks or a, whatever to fill all, all your I'll, I'll uh, give you property a real-world scenario. I, I, I went to a concert a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to do the focus group of one, but only to illustrate the Because we point. recommend that. Correct. Tim, correct. well, correct. Always. Correct. But for only all to, focus groups, if you just act, ask Tim, you get the Tim, answers Tim you is, need. Tim is statistically valid on his own. Exactly. Well, you're not, you're not wrong, so that's true. Mm -hmm. um, in this specific case. No, but I'm, I'm more for illustration purposes. Not This is not representative of everybody. This is representative of a traveler on a trip, right? We went to a concert a couple of weeks ago at Mohegan Sun, uh, which is, you know, it's the casino up in northeast Connecticut, Um for people who don't know that geography, it is the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's, you know, it's out in the woods. Um, but we were going to see a concert up there. Who and are you seeing, Tim? We were seeing Sarah Bareilles, as a matter of fact. Uh, oh, and I missed her last week. She came, yeah, she came through through Texas, on, too. And put on a, 20 put on buck a, tickets. Put on a damn 20 fine buck show. tickets. That's a great oh, deal. She's great. That it is an amazing show. deal, and I couldn't, I couldn't make it. So. so Mohegan Sun has got the most interesting rep management I've ever seen in my life. Um, because on any given Saturday night, Mohegan Sun probably goes for $179 a night. You know, I'm, I'm picking a number that I think is correct. And when they have specific events going on, the prices go up, you know, 
five fold, six fold. Yeah. Um, and it really just varies based on what's going on at their arena and things along those lines, how, how different the prices are. Um, and so the, the tickets at Mohegan Sun for that, for one night were uh, $690. Now, I like Sarah Brill, is, so I was looking forward to the but show. But it's not but also, a $690 a night hotel, <laughs> by any stretch of the means. It's Well, it certainly isn't in my mind when they would have charged me $179 if I stayed over on Friday night instead, right? And, you know, it, they definitely create some value perception problems from that perspective. Yeah. But but there was a hotel just down the road a piece that has a shuttle that runs between the, the, the uh, casino and the hotel yeah. on a 20-minute turn around <laughs> and was, you know, $280 or something along those lines. What? Now, if that hotel didn't exist, I'm probably booking the room at Mohegan Sun because there was nothing else convenient. I'm not driving after the concert and going to the casino for a little bit after the show back to a hotel at, you know, midnight or one o'clock in the morning or things along those right. lines. So at that point, proximity was less important because I had the ability to get from where I was to where I wanted to be you know, timely, easily, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of the point is not that this is the focus group that matters, but that each traveler for each trip is going to make a decision that say, what are the, what, which of those components matter for this trip and how am I valuing those to say, this is what's, this is a good price or this is a terrible price. This yeah. is a place I will stay right. or this is a place I won't but, but stay. And we're back to trip personas. Back to trip personas. How do we well, get yeah, yeah, around yeah. that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. If, for example, Ed would never have roughed it on a public transportation with the, you know, the ruffians, <laughs> the peasants, right? He would have gladly paid the extra three hundred dollars a night to avoid that. Well, well wait. Well, wait. Do Actually, they have a helicopter? I have, Do they a, have very, a helipad. Uh, I have a story <laughs> that I told for weeks on this show back in the early days. Uh, same exact situation, different casino. It's Hard Rock in Tampa, who has a oh, concert yeah. venue right across the yeah. from them. Yeah. And uh, they were over $1,000 a night to stay at the Hard Rock yeah. in Tampa. Uh, and I'm sorry, there is no version of anything that would make me pay $1,000 a night for the Hard Rock in Tampa. So I went searching and just prayed <laughs> on a, uh, a uh, revenue manager who was asleep at the wheel. And I got to stay <laughs> at a beautiful La Meridian for $149 oh, that hurts. Uh, on a night yeah. when the Aloft, uh, when the aloft was two hundred and eighteen dollars, I actually was worried. Uh, like, wow, is this La Meridian broken or something? And it was the most beautiful <laughs> hotel to the point where I had to. I emailed the director of sales and was like, "Listen, man, you had Tampa Comic Con going on. You had, and actually, it was um, Counting Crows and um, is that where you got the side uh, of the car? The lead singer? No, no, I got this from my wife years ago. But it was Counting Crows and Rob Thomas in concert, oh. and that's what we were going to see." Um, and was it so we, Q1? What's that? Was it in Q1? I don't know. Why Did were you, you the revenue Q4? manager over that? <laughs> no, I just, like, I think it's really funny because in all the years that I've been doing this, still to this day, I guarantee you that there is a huge percentage of hotels out there right now who have not set their 2020 rates yet. Because oh, yeah. I look oh, at it as yeah. a calendar year, so oh, yeah. that can that can really lead to some of those. So that made me wonder if you booked it in like Q3 or Q4. For it would have been Q. It would have been Q2 actually. It would have been Q2. Um, and but I mean, here's the thing: the aloft right down the street was way more expensive for an aloft. And right. so you know, I was saying to my wife, I'm like, we may get there and be surprised but you know the meridian brand standard is like really solid so we're going to try this and it, it was amazing it's an old courthouse yeah. it was a federal courthouse that got turned into a la meridian and each room was a judge's quarters they left it oh, as a courthouse. oh that's cool that's, that's super great. neat yeah um but you know had they run a shuttle they probably could have gotten 500 bucks on a package uh do dinner because their restaurant was amazing do dinner and a shuttle to the concert and they That's could have cool. sold out at five hundred bucks, uh, yeah. uh, you know, a person or a couple. And you still um, would have been making money compared to what you would have paid for the Hard Rock. Oh, and, the, and the current tip on that is just to include an Uber gift card because, right. you know, if you don't already yeah. have a shuttle, 
than the licensing and the insurance. They did. That they did okay, have a shuttle. That right. That's why I was. But, uh, that's why. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's they actually had a shuttle. We took the crazy. shuttle, but had they so like we took the shuttle because it was right at the edge of how far it would go. So like just took out this random point. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. The AC um, hotel at, at LAX. Um, didn't have a shuttle. They provided Uber. Basically, they called Uber and billed it to the hotel. So they yeah. just, you know, come, which is going to be very interesting because LAX is now kind of outlawed Uber's dropping at the ter- picking up and dropping <laughs> yeah. off at the terminals. Right, you have to now go go offsite, which is a big problem with LAX. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know how many other airport properties will go hey we can save on the on the fuel on the equipment on the staffing yeah. and just mm-hmm. do yeah interesting interesting possibility so and if but then again wrong, they don't get they also don't have the checkbox though of having airport shuttle on expedia or whatever because they don't sure. do they do they or don't they right you get in some pretty interesting I think it's yeah. a good I have a lot of airport hotels though that just keep those little you can just buy the little like ten dollar credit so from a service recovery standpoint, when your shuttle gets stuck in traffic, you're like, here, just use this credit and, and go type thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these guys, they had no equipment. They did not have a shuttle at all, right? It was just this is how they did it. And so, that was so we're now heading towards the time where normally Tim Peter is going to tell us and remind us that he has customers. Um, so do we want to uh, move to the rut row? Um the rut row and rut row a which seem to be in disagreement with each other uh oh what do we think? Really? <laughs> yeah and you know i'm just gonna jump in and start the conversation here by saying that this is a great example of you can make your data say whatever you want <laughs> your data to say. <laughs> so, and, so we should tell people what the rut row and the rut yes, row yes. b yes. are yeah well, you the rut row, yeah the rut row is titled by um you know, boarding area, which is a blog that focuses on you know frequent travel, frequent travelers, and things like that. And then another one, one mile at a time, similar similar blog. So the first one was Bonvoid, SPG members leaving Marriott data suggests. And then the second one was survey people overwhelmingly prefer Marriott Bonvoy question mark exclamation point. So these are um, uh, and. You have to understand the rut rows are not always apparent. You know, who's who's it a rut row for? <laughs> but uh, but for this, these are a couple disgruntled former SPG members who are still griping at, at Marriott yeah. and Starwood. And and that's kind of my my point. And Lily, you're absolutely right that you can make the numbers whatever you want, but there's also a law of large numbers problem here. So, as a guy who worked at the world's largest hotel company by one measure. I once did something. No, no, no. I'm, I'm telling a very specific story. We once made a change to the website. I ran e-commerce. I ran uh, digital for the company. We made a change to the website that pissed off a very small portion of our hotels, a very small portion of our franchisees. We pissed off somewhere between 5 and 10%. At the time, we had 7,000 franchisees. So I had about 700 angry franchisees to deal with, which at the time, those 700 angry franchisees would have been roughly the third or fourth largest hotel company all by themselves. (laughs) When you're a big company and you've got a lot of scale to deal with, you know, Marriott could be doing it right for 99% of their members and have a million pissed off (laughs) members, right? Right. (laughs) So, so I mean... I think I think from everything I've seen, Bonvoy seems to be doing okay-ish, maybe, but I think we're going to still need to see. But they probably did piss off a lot of people who were in uh, Starwood Elite and things like that, and oh, yeah. they probably did it on Which, purpose because it's going to cost be them a lot of you, money, you know? As someone who has seen guest feedback at scale for some of these brands, yeah. your elite members are the absolute worst people in the mm-hmm. world. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so easily offended. Like it, it, the guest feedback from an, and I won't say the status because I don't want to give away the brand, but the guest feedback that comes from the top status of one of these major brands always reads exactly the same which starts with do you know who i am okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. and you must and I not really understand. feel bad when i send that email i have to admit right <laughs> um, it's uh it's it's uh it's a, actually a huge problem because you set such unrealistic expectations of entitlement for these yep. 
people. Um, and, and a lot of these people are road warriors. So if you actually think about it, it's, it's a, it's kind of a double edged problem. So road warriors generally are not senior managers in their organization. So they're generally people who are probably kind of crapped on in the, uh, corporate hierarchy. So then you give them, you give them this very strong sense of entitlement during a time that they're probably being crapped on. That's why they're on that trip. Um, and so any friction like oh my bottle of water had a dent in the side of it you know my plastic <laughs> bottle of water had a dent in the side of it i have never been so offended as an elite member of this and i will never and they always wrap with the same so it always starts with do you know who i am and it always wraps with and i will never stay, never stay with you again with you again Wait, Ed, so all the elite members are millennials? You said they're entitled. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you'd be amazed at how many boomers uh, can wear oh, those yeah. entitled pants uh, very easily. And you make my uh, point for me. That is yes. not a generational issue, I don't Correct. think. That's no, a, it gets yeah. blamed on millennials all the time. Um, it sure but, does. Yeah, I, I think it's really very interesting. And I think that whenever we're looking at something like this, of course, Marriott has a vested interest in making us believe that Bonvoy is really well loved, right? But you always have to look at these things in a multitude of ways. And so if you go back a couple of weeks, we talked about the earnings reports from both Marriott and Hilton and what's happening for them with ADR and things like that. And if I recall correctly, Marriott was definitely looking stronger than Hilton. And I thought it was interesting that they were using Hilton as, you know, everybody's fleeing to Hilton's program in one of these two articles. But the data doesn't necessarily suggest that when you look at the earnings. Granted, that's all earnings and not loyalty. But I think that we are hard pressed to say that, oh, it's so much of a problem in Bonvoy that non-loyalty members are somehow saving Marriott. Well, on the other hand, on the other hand, third quarter earnings though were not good, and and Arnie had to to kind of use the Hong Kong Hong disruption Kong. Yeah. as as yeah, a crutch, which, did sound a which, little, uh... which didn't actually impact Hilton at all, which is a little and odd. China so. is China is exactly where I was going to go next too. Oh, yeah. It also said that forty percent of the new signups are from China. Oh, oh. Marriott has a new deal with Alibaba. Alibaba, and so. Mm -hmm. Maybe 20% of the Bonvoy customers left, but it's being sort of covered up by all of these new entrants from right. into Bonvoy. And so looking at things as an aggregate positions at the way that they want to, because if Marriott can make everybody believe that Bonvoy is well loved, people will believe it and they will sign up. That's just yeah. the way that perception works. It's, it's yeah. totally a PR. They're going to wish it into reality. Exactly. Yeah, you know, right. the, the positive the spin that, is, the positive spin of, you know, we have twenty percent more uh redemption of room use. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. You're look at all these people earning and using or they're cashing out so they can move. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean right. Well, right. And, so you and can make the data you can make the data say whatever you want it to say from a PR standpoint. Um, as a parallel, though, I see a lot of hoteliers who make data say whatever they want it to say to their owners, and that's totally fine, I suppose, if that's the way that you want to go, but I sure hope you're not basing strategy on a false interpretation of data. Yeah. The same can be said for vendors providing I was data. just going to go there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yep. At attribution yeah. theft. Yeah. yeah well, and, real. and actually the thing with Ali, we had the other thing about um, a core has a deal with Alibaba. And I believe IHG may have been the first one. They're all doing deals with Alibaba because it's all fliggy, right? And it's right, a mobile right. app and that's how you get into it. And it's basically, you get a store, right? It's like having a store on Amazon or any or anything else, except the it has more favorable economics. That's the bottom you know, line. Yeah. They're seeking you know, distribution with more favorable economics. But you can't that's put it that way, line. Robert, because right, right now, Marriott and Accor have both benefited by, look at how smart we are. We made a deal with Alibaba, which right. sounds like this was something that didn't exist before, uh, right. you know, let alone not something that you literally can just go and register for uh, and, and fulfill pretty much the same exact terms of the deal on. 
I'm pretty <laughs> sure, yeah. And and this is a great deal for Alibaba. Now, also, interestingly, Chinese um, outbound traffic is way down, right? That's dropped rather precipitously, and that's not that's not good. And the U.S.-China you know, trade war is, is one of the factors there where they're going. Wait a second, which again, from a U.S. foreign policy perspective, is just ridiculous because if you're oh. looking at at trade Tim, imbalances, Tim, trade no, imbalances, no, 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 boy, no. you want I'm just you want trap. You want why I'm late for my call. <laughs> <laughs> now wait. Okay, I want to say one thing about. We are very glad to have Lily and Stephanie here because Tim, if it was just like Ed Stewart and I. He would be gone. He would have been gone 15 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm wondering why I'm not gone now. But <laughs> oh, by the way, Tim, thank you Ed. for listening to my sales pitch on the New Jersey vote against Airbnb and oh, then going yes. and making oh, yeah, it and I'm happen. The one who pushed, I was the one who pushed it over the top. That's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Every vote Absolutely. counts. Every vote counts. Every vote counts. <laughs> well, nonetheless. So it is the top of the hour. It's actually just a little past the top of the Lauren, hour. Lauren, are you be... still there? Laura, is Lauren still there? Chat to us, Lauren. Still well, once Tim, once Tim, if people want to find you or 85% of the contents of the internet, where should they go? They should go to flip.to. That's flip.to. <laughs> for. Uh, no, you can find me at timpeter.com. Um, it's not 85%. It can't be more than 84%. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, I did look, uh, 1150 pipe properties in the pipeline for a core. Uh, I couldn't find a number on new construction. Mm. So nonetheless, but, uh, I can be found at timpeter.com. I'm TC Peter on Twitter, uh, and all that good stuff. So, <laughs> well, Tim, so, thanks nonetheless, for joining us today. Lovely thanks seeing for you going all. Stephanie, a pleasure, a pleasure uh, meeting you on the show. <laughs> uh, look forward to the ongoing discussions and, if I can offer some unsolicited advice for next week, you know, work on sharpening up your elbows so you can just elbow in. <laughs> exactly. There you go. There you oh, go. By, by the way, you get designated devil's advocate next week. So we rotate. So we, we do. We have to argue the opposite point to everyone else just to make, make it more interesting. Exactly. All right. You guys have a great weekend. Look forward to seeing you all next week and uh, sell lots of hotel rooms. All right. See you soon. <laughs> See you, Jim. See ya. That, that is a, a conference um thing I would I would really like to do is to have you have two people you have the topics so they know the topics but they draw out of a hat and one person has to be pro one person has to be con they go at it for whatever you know five minutes each or ten minutes whatever it is and then they switch well and you know, what an amazing amazing idea, idea, Robert. wait 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 yeah. Stuart, Stuart go for it Robert that is yeah. the most original idea I've ever heard you have all right, go ahead, Stuart. No, All right, so Ed and I were scheduled to do that exact thing at a conference next week that actually, unfortunately, just got postponed till May. But um, uh, it, that's the exact format we're doing. We don't know what side we're arguing until we're on stage, and we got like five different topics to to argue. Yeah. So. It's a great it's a great training tool too. I mean, it's great for conferences because, frankly, I always prefer a panel that has you know a difference of opinion, whether yeah. genuine yeah. or not. You know, either way, yeah. it, it opens up discussion, but I use that a lot with my revenue consultants when we're trying to present data to an ownership. And I'm like, okay, so that's your stance. Great. Tell me why you are wrong. Right. Come up with all the ways that you could possibly be wrong. And yeah. it's really, it's a great exercise to help with presentation skills. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, it, it, our thought of doing it was it would help the audience, you know, make their own decisions versus just going along with the echo chamber that tends to happen at conferences what? and all the panels these days. They That's have to make I'm... decisions now? I, I know. Mm. It's amazing. They're asking a lot there. Not well, without did... their seven other people in their organization also being involved all in this, it. All the so, I mean, nod and agree, yeah. <laughs> hey, Lauren's right. back. And so, Lauren Gray, hey, did you know we had a web show today, Lauren? Holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> I was in the back baking cookies. Uh, have a <laughs> daylight savings got you, didn't it? <laughs> Arguing with Restream because we're going in and out on LinkedIn Live, and and I've done all the things they asked me to do on tech. Which, by the way, thank you for letting me actually play tech in the background today because it allowed me while during the live broadcast get Restream in there and go look. Look at my feed, man. It's dropping off every nine milliseconds. I've done everything you've asked. What is it? Oh, we need to get this platform that costs six hundred dollars a year. And I'm like, yeah, no, no. You said you can do this. <laughs> I think you're so anyway. going to wind up at Zoom at some point. 
is my when, theory. When are we, when are we oh, gonna it's not Women Are Damned. No, 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 no. It has yeah, when are we this, going? This when are we going to the new platform that was awesome and not this platform? Yeah, well, well it doesn't crash actually at the minutes. end of the month. But that isn't the problem. Actually, Webinar Jam for the first time is not the issue. It's the simulcasting platform restream. This broadcast is fine, and it broadcasts to every platform except for LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a different criteria for their live, which is a one millisecond latency factor. All other platforms run on a nine millisecond, so I'm finding. So what? the wow, restream what? No, platform that simulcasts me out is having a problem keeping the consistency of connectivity with LinkedIn. They say they don't, but they're the ones that are keep falling off. All the other platforms are fine. So whether we go on the new platform or not, the restream simulcasting is the problem right now. I, I so. for one, think this is a user error, personally. Yeah, yeah I'm going to say yeah. it is. No, it's I'm between the happy. keyboard and the floor. I know. It's between the mm -hmm. keyboard and the floor. I'm with you. Here's it's what fine. really happened while Lauren was not on. Uh, he upgraded his mobile phone plan. He called and made some doctor's <laughs> appointments. Uh, I went on the doctor's He watched The Mandalorian. Yeah. He watched The Mandalorian <laughs> again. Yeah. I, I, all I know is when I leave, all of a sudden, Robert turns into this different person. I mean, <laughs> this, uh, like, he's quite an animal. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. getting emotionally ready for for. Did you did right you get did, were you hanging out with Ed for any length of time? Is that what happened? Yeah, you I know. Ed I know. Or what? I mean, Ed's going a little soft these days. Uh, we gotta do something to really, yeah, you know, like poke him. Yeah, you know, poke well, the bear. Something you gotta pick something challenging. These Talk about UCF topics. How, how trash oh yeah, yeah, that'll get him fired up. Yeah, really yeah. Hey, I just coming from a South Carolina family. and Lily stepping in and not holding their own, but pushing you all back into the corner, going, yeah, we'll prove it. <laughs> yeah, these these are all soft topics, Robert. You're not picking like the really dangerous topics anymore. I, I think you're, you're the one who's bring up bring up privacy, yeah. data privacy. That would be yeah, yeah, I the, 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 AI, the AI one. The AI one was pretty interesting. That VentureBeat article was pretty long. Oh, the ethics of AI and stuff. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, lots of sections um, on that. That's just a good, yeah. a good long read. So, so, can I add an advice column moment to yes. this for our listeners? Because <laughs> uh, this yeah. topic has repeatedly come up for me with multiple clients over the last ninety days or so. Before so, you can wait, wait. You have to name the advice column before you can move forward. Ask oh, Lily. Oh gosh. Wait, Lily? Yeah, Lily. No pressure, no oh, pressure yeah, to that's... be super creative on the spot. Well, you guys are the marketing people, right? So that's why I'm asking you this. Yeah. I'm I'm positing the question. I'm not giving the advice here. Lily, all of you. Yeah, no, not it. No. Representative Lily is here to uh, to represent my clients and several other interested parties. So, destination properties specifically that do not have true competitors in their market. So we're talking super nice resorts that are surrounded by Best Westerns, Courtyards, Hampton Inns, whatever, sure. what have you. And markets that maybe aren't considered destination, because if they were, let's be honest, there would be competitors. We're not talking about Scottsdale here. These are places where the property itself kind of creates the destination. So it's a two part question. Number one, how do you position yourself and how do you select a comp set from a marketing perspective in uh -huh. order to get more national instead of local exposure because you don't need local exposure, you need people to come to your destination. And number two is how do you get that exposure on a national level without having to resort to things like travel zoo or Groupon as marketing tactics when you aren't able to use destination marketing because your destination isn't marketing because it's really just you and so they have no interest. <coughs> Lengthy you want to now or I, you want to wait till next week? I can Your call. Um, so yeah. depending on the destination, if airlift plays a role in how people get there, uh, is look at the source markets of the routes that are currently in play uh, and then use that to uh, create really targeted geo uh, profiles uh, and really target uh, your airlift. If it's a drive market, I mean, it actually, you know, you got to look at why people would be driving. Are you a drive market that you're the destination uh, or are you on the way? And then what behaviorally you're trying to do uh, from there. I mean, you do not have to be a destination to take part in brand USA level uh, marketing initiatives mm -hmm. and state level marketing initiatives. 
so, you know, again, depending on where you are, look to see if your state is uh, funding any type of marketing initiative, because actually that's targeted to help you as a destination upon itself more than it would help a major destination inside the state. Uh, so I would look at those things. Well, okay. and, and what I, I, are I those? Answer, I, I would also right, talk good. to your guests, you know, understand the guests that you already have, who they are, what they why they chose you, you know, what other things they look at, you know, what, what are the, in their minds, your competition. I think that can help you define right. what the comp set is as well. Right. That goes to my two definition points. There's what's called symbiotic market competition, where I used to have properties in Key West that were competing with Aspen all the time. And it's Absolutely. not because they have similar products or not. It's because they have similar demographics. The mm -hmm. causation of the travel is the variation of choice. So what you're competing with at the decision processes of of the discoveries and choice process, not the acquisition of it, but the discovery and the decision processes of it, who you're competing with in that market space is one. And to uh, Stuart's point, your demographic profiling is key and element to that. What are they traveling to you for and defining those feeder resource markets? And to what Ed said, when it comes to the airlift, it not going just to the core hub systems where they're flying out of Atlanta and Miami, Let's but rather the yeah. increase inventory lift off from the feeder markets that are driving to to those hubs that they're arriving to you from what is the causation of the airports increase in lift from those locations and do they match the demographic profile of your guests that are coming to your, your market historically so those are two additions to that and robert i'm sorry i stepped over you no 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 and and it's the same thing and a lot of market i mean you mentioned aspen aspen has three distinct you know markets they've got you know the the local um or front range people really from from denver mm -hmm. um they've got yeah. international jet setters from around the world and then they have kind of in the middle is kind of the u.s market and it's not just skiers right because summer's a really different different market but those are very very different so in some and cases they, their market inventory too to accommodate yeah. that they don't they don't allow variations from their market segments to vary from the people that are driving there to it i mean they yeah. don't allow you know Sorry to say, best Westerns on the fringe of town. That just doesn't happen. You know, yeah. they have their they have their inventory specific to types. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's interesting. But all those, you know, the hotel industry has a lot of complexities with things like that. It isn't. Everybody knows it isn't just one size fits all. And you just here's a plan. Although a lot of organizations do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, right. I, I don't think anybody who's on this on this show does, except for Stuart, of course. Of course, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, right? yeah. And it's a really it's a really interesting problem too, because you know we we will sometimes look at things like on Expedia, for example, which has done a good job of building out internally some analytics that hotels can look at. So if we feel like a hotel may not be picking the same comp set that their customers are picking, because let's be honest, your customers yeah. determine your comp set, not yeah. you, yeah. no matter what you want to believe. So yeah. if you look at, you know, oh, they also looked at this or this or this, but it's specific to that location search. So is there a resource that you guys use to get data on, okay, I'm looking at Key West and Aspen, or for example, we had properties in wine country that, lost some business when they got a lot of snow or they got a lot of rain and Lake Tahoe got a lot of snow. And although we couldn't use data to back it up, we were theorizing that people decided to take a ski vacation instead of a wine yeah. vacation. That See, year. The simplest one and the freest one is Google Trends. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. just burrow into that first go top end. To put the two markets against each other, then start yeah, going down the rabbit hole. It's it's tough. Tough. The granularity is tough on that, though. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, yeah. No, have, I'm not. I'm not saying it's an overlap. Starting point. Yeah. 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 You have the, yeah. It's yeah. just I, does this validate my assumption? Yeah. yeah no. There's and you so don't have you don't have you know sentiment. You don't have sentiment either because um, if you look at the Dominican Republic, who has been just ravished in terms of of their demand based on what five deaths or something you know five yeah, right. you know, traveler that. deaths um really really bad really bad situation the google trend stuff's pretty solid because yeah. it's all negative sentiment it's not true yeah. there's a I, I, I would say one oft overlooked opportunity that every hotel especially if you're a repeat destination should be using is surveying all their guests every year, sending out yep. like a yep. one time a year survey to ask those kind of questions, you know? Yeah. Uh, but so I think you do like, 
It, it, most of these hotels are wanting to tap into guests that they don't already have, and while other guests may have similar sentiments, well, if they did, then they they might. Then I have a very them. strong suggestion for that: is engage your past guests to get them to introduce you to their friends and family who are in similar. Yeah. If only there was a product that did that. I you know. know. Like, like, like flip. Yeah, yeah, look, 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 two, two other things to that. One is obviously go to your sentiment, go into look alike audiences, go into your insights if you have a strong social engagement. But the other is, and I've had good good success with this. Google surveys, build a yeah. well-constructed yeah. Google yep. survey out there, and you're going to get the sentiment beyond your guest profiles yeah, as to sure. the perception of your that's market and push yeah. that yeah. out as well. And, that, and, and that's pretty cost effective. You could do it pretty inexpensively. An yeah. amazing program. Yeah. 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 And use Flip2. And use Flip2. I, I would agree with that. I imagine, given the Expedia conferences this week, that uh, we don't have a lot of listeners from Expedia. But I will say that it's a huge data selling opportunity that the oh. OTAs are not taking advantage of that they could because obviously they probably have the data on okay one user logged on and they searched these three destinies oh, yeah they don't they don't probably have that data they absolutely yeah. Yeah. They have, have it and, data. Data. and it's informing it. and it's informing all of their PPC campaigns yes, all their SEO are, stuff right. they are weaponizing it yeah that's how they win uh, <laughs> yeah. is their massive amount of data and and well stored uh, and well used yeah. uh, is is definitely what gets them selling during time periods that feels like you they're the only ones who can drive demand. Yeah, the right. sophistication and the AI driving their um, PPC campaign is just astounding. I mean, they are I'm willing very to bet you it's not basically. AI though, Robert. I'm willing what? to bet you it's, well, no, it's, it's probably it's just pretty. Good, it's good, really good big data. Predictive without, 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 yeah. without, but they're they're trying they're trying to layer in some some sure. AI to to learn from the data and to identify those patterns, right? Stuff, yeah, yeah. Right. Mostly yeah. for yeah. mostly for pattern recognition, I right. think they're using the AI. So right. I wish I wish right. someone would work on that for just yeah. regular hotels to be able to have. But so to, let's to, imagine it's tough for the data leisure, though. right? We're talking leisure travel mostly when we're talking destination mm -hmm. markets, right? Maybe some group, but you know, no, more, I, Destination hotels and resorts would disagree with you greatly. I mean, their group business was substantial. Sure, uh, but I mean, for purposes of like my focus group, and since Tim Peter's not here and we can't do a focus group of one, I'm going to try a focus group of five here and just see what comes out of it. So who's so, not allowed to talk then? You? <laughs> I think or is I'm it one of us? Yeah, she doesn't I'm, want your opinion. An advocate your, your opinion doesn't so, count. Okay. When when you guys are picking a leisure destination, you want to go on vacation. I imagine there's more than one place in the world that you would consider. How do you choose your destination? Who has cheapest flights? Mm. Yeah, I think what? flights are a factor. Weather uh, differential yeah. is one of the key things for me uh, because I live in a very hot and uncomfortable place most of the time of the year. And then the other parts of the time of the year, it's just really nice here and you don't want to leave. So weather differential is important to me, uh, family friendly, because I, if I'm traveling on leisure, I'm traveling with my family, uh, which also then leads me to a uh, full service resort, meaning, you know, spa, golf, something for the kids, probably something with water. But I, and I do this search two to three times a year, don't even care where I'm going to go. Uh, and every time Have I'm asking the question. you on Google family friendly full service resorts? With a average temperature, and I'll actually do average temperature of X in this month. Yeah. So in the summer, I'm looking to get something that's at least 10 degrees cooler than Orlando. Uh, in the winter, I'm actually looking for where is snow. Uh, that's really it, to bring my kids to play in snow. I think that's interesting, right? That's, cool that's a really, that's that's a that's really sophisticated <laughs> search term, and I think that's how people I work are in trending travel. now, right? But, but not yeah. even you. If you look at the trend of what people are searching, you know, 10% of all keywords that are entered into Google have never been searched before. People are getting more granular in how they search, more specific mm -hmm. in how they search. So, so I think that's it, it keeps coming back. I keep repeating myself, but talking to the guests you have, because the next, the best next guest typically is very similar in a lot of attributes to the guests you have. So understanding what their thought process is and, and leveraging that to apply, you know, build out content, build out advertising plans based on what you can learn from your existing guests, I think is always the way to go. Well, and understanding uh, those personas, if you want to keep it simple, right, mm -hmm. is, right. you know, here are the top three 
reasons people are staying here with these kinds of you know patterns and hopefully understanding the profitability associated with those and maybe the acquisition cost would be right. from the demographic point of view from the age categorization that robert and i kind of fall into it has to be worth the effort and it has to be some place of interest it mm -hmm. isn't a financial consideration it isn't necessarily a previous visit consideration or in some cases family yeah. consideration. So whether is it worth the effort for me to go and do this? Is it something I haven't done before or something? But to go back to something else is we're, we're from what we're doing in, a, in one of our clients in Vancouver with this video connections to restaurants and trying to get to the gear, Google zero click and really improving our localized schema is we're finding out what we don't know is what we really truly really don't know. There are people that travel for reasons we don't even consider. We, we put ourselves in paradigms and then uh, paradigms. Sorry. And, and, you know, there's people that travel because of food. There's people that travel because of um, mm -hmm. cultures. There's people that travel because of uh, communities. Mm -hmm. and, and I say this because the hotel is located by an <coughs> community. It's located by an amazing uh, Korean restaurant area. It's, uh, uh, and there's an amazing Korean culture that's there as well. And that's because Freddie Cooper has the best sushi I've ever had. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Hands so down. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where now we're finding because we're becoming the authorities of our localized restaurants because we've made this effort. We're getting a lot of people that are coming in to the website that are looking for that relationship between those three Absolutely. things. That was a new thing. We didn't consider that in the process. We considered in authenticating our, our localization of, of our value proposition of the hotel the, rather than the fact that we are now are turning into a leader of the of those initiatives of people's interest. So it is literally what you don't know, you don't know. Um, but that means there's a lot of these variations that you can not plan for, but you certainly optimize kind of like what we've had earlier discussions where <clears throat> because of attribution strings, you can begin to determine the context of what the attribution string was created for, whether it was an event driven thing, whether it was a, just a business swell or whatever. But if you can finite the content out of the page, your organic value contribution, and then separate that to improve conversion, you really can do those things. Because if you look at what's causing that string to be developed, you can isolate out the commonality of that string and highlight it and see if you can amplify that, that conversion strings value proposition. And that's just being attentive to the process. Yeah. And being able to work with, you know, as, if there are some great restaurants who are terrific partners and who knows, they're bringing in vintners or doing whatever may, you know, a guest chef from a, from a different restaurant, from a different, all of a sudden, if you can, you can start working with them and say, Hey, we can put them up. You know, we will we will house them here. Can we do this? Can we do a package where we can promote this to this and we start doing this for our guests? You can do some fantastic. Well, you know, the one, really, the really one common thing event. in market, the one common thing in market is nobody has all the resources to do all this stuff right all the time. Right. And so even these restaurants who want more business for themselves, they don't have other than their cousin in the back, you know, the back room doing their social sometimes. And you can actually improve their business by being better at their business than they are for themselves. Yep. You know, not that you're doing their localized promotions, but you're creating a, a, a voice for them by your mere association of content associated with them. And that's what we're finding is we're actually and, able. And here's the biggest thing about all of this that I hate when I hear a hotel say it, where they don't want to feature the restaurants of the area because they have a restaurant. Um, <laughs> like unless you're a one night stay, someone's not going to eat at your restaurant every single meal of the entire time that they're there. So stop. Okay. Yeah. Unless you can uh, identify that market segment. <laughs> right. <laughs> People the, who love the, eating the bubble in a boy convention over and over. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, so being a, uh, you know, being a hub of your community and exposing what's special about your community will actually open up uh, new markets to you. For sure. uh, and, and, and also, by the way, it shows the personality of your hotel and it shows that you're not some evil, faceless corporation. Like okay. most hotels have marketed themselves for years. Yep. And create that advocacy really of that question. community. Is that, that, did we actually answer her question? No. I don't know. No, don't no we've it, gone yeah. completely off the rails because yeah. she said it was a destination Shocking. that didn't Shocking. have anything. So, <laughs> you know, uh, there are no restaurants around these types of properties because they're a destination in themselves. So, yeah. So, Lauren, you're wrong. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Robert, you're wrong. I was wrong. I'll be wrong. Hey, I just got a picture of my travel plan idea. Anything, whatever Stuart wrong. said was good to travel to. That was Again, my goal. The, was whatever said Stuart said to travel to, I would. So the impact of Stephanie and Lily being here. Ed has never said he's been wrong. Actually, no. yeah, on the show or off of the in, show. In the life in general. Someone I took two hundred and thirty-three wow. show, two hundred and twenty-three shows to, to yeah. hit that mark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
All right, guys, we're I got to jump we're, off. Yeah, I do too. We're, we're actually, actually at the two-hour mark, which uh, yeah. makes Facebook kick us off automatically because they don't go over two hours without uh, being, you know, Neither Zuckerberg. Neither do our viewers. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I got to figure out how to slice up the one-hour show for uh, IGTV. I gotta, well, no, 10-minute slice, and then I got to do an hour slice for reloading up on LinkedIn. Um, with that being said, uh, to as a wrap up, uh, we'll go backwards on the things. Since Stephanie, you last to join, you're first to say where is it and what? Who are you and what is it you do and where can they find you? Uh, Stephanie Spark Smith on LinkedIn, CogwellMarketing.com for all other things related to digital marketing for branded hotels. How did it go backwards before? Uh, Robert, Robert, you were you were you were later to the oh, party. Well, little, speaking of backwards, let's go to Robert. Robert, exactly. Robert. K. Cole on social media, rockcheetah.com, or next week I will see people at the Focus Right conference. No. Yeah, what will we do? Actually, no, I didn't find enough coin in the, the free sofa. The live stream is a, great, is a great thing. There are going to be some good, uh, some good yeah. sections you can. Uh, yeah. I, am, I am hoping they ask some pointed questions to the CEO of OYO and don't go softball. They should not. They're going to go softball. I really hope, I really hope not. So no, I certainly, the, the questions, what they do is have all the analysts submit questions to who's going to moderate the different panels and discussions. So uh, I loaded up some really good ones for the hotel one, which will be hotel distribution, which uh, we'll see. And I think they're, go I think Lorraine will go there. So that's good. Right. So I'm not doing uh, the panel this year. It's a toss up between Ed and Stuart. Who would like to go? I will Ed. allow Stuart. Wow. Oh, no, it's so oh, up to you. Oh, right. wow. Oh, wow. Well, wow. Thank you. Oh, we're so good on. All right. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about Flip2, you can go to flip.to. Uh, you can listen to the Fuel podcast, who kindly speaks about us on pretty much a weekly basis, and we appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you can find out more about me on social media, Edward St. Ange, and uh, now Stuart. The man from New Zealand. <laughs> hey, we almost got through a whole episode. Without Can't making fun of my accent, almost. So um, fueltravel.com fueltravel slash podcast is where you can get all our content. There's actually a recent episode where Stephanie was a guest, so um, and that was a really Woo! good episode. We, we looked at what um, what independent hotels can learn from the, the brands. It was really good. I think it was episode 124, 3? I don't remember. Yeah, something like that. So good go time. check it out. Steph, you made it on yeah. the show before any of us. Good congratulations. Now, Steph, did you get the uh, complimentary stew brew? Did he send it to you yet for being on the show? <laughs> I've got yeah. I've got a new batch being made right now. There's none. There's none active. No, I'm, just, at this I'm point. just waiting for you guys to start making fun of my accent, not Stewart's anymore. So <laughs> you guys are just let me. Uh, you have to get in on the in conversation more for us to pick up on it. Yeah, you got to come in so we can pick up and, on it. Yeah. Lily, since you were so kind to be the first to join us, where is it they can find you? What is it you do? Lily Mockerman on LinkedIn. I am the CEO of Total Customized Revenue Management, which you can find at tcrmservices.com. And coming soon, you can also find me at thinkupenterprises.com. More to come on that later. Think Ooh. Up Enterprises. Ooh, we got to hear more about taking, that. Later. Taking the Lauren Gray strategy of if you get a longer URL, then you <laughs> really drive this. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> That's right. And speaking of which, Lauren Gray, who is your daddy and what does he do? Who's my daddy? <laughs> this, okay, for this and all previous 222 episodes, you can go to currently still until we change the domain, hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. Look for show number 223, the link for that. And of course, all previous episodes for well over five and a half years, although Stuart says I can't have a one year birthday, are all located there as well. Uh, we have to apologize for Holly. We ran out of time for her joining today. Holly, sorry, we couldn't have you join. Uh, too bad. No. <laughs> We always, by the way, just so you all know, we always give grief to the co-host that doesn't show up. And if you don't show up, we give you a grief about you. We'll set, we'll talk about you. We'll make up reasons why you aren't here. Yeah, uh, everything can be and very, I understand very, this yeah. show is now so popular that there was a queue for hosts. To come there was a queue for hosts. Right. We, yeah, we now right. officially have more hosts than viewers. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Stuart, Stuart. We no, broke no, no. the count. That has been yeah, consistent that's, the that's entire the time. Well, I was about to say, even when I'm on a show of one, we have more than the viewers. I mean, yeah, what, what, what point are you making, Stuart? It's the same number. No. <laughs> number of hosts minus one equals minus viewers. One. That, is the, yeah. that is the algorithm. Now, we do yeah. have, um, just so you all know, at the, the last Friday of this month, uh, which is the Black Friday, 
We do have uh, Katya Mohammed from Alhoa. She is the uh, director of uh, education for Alhoa. Wow. She's going to be on for the show. She wants to talk about, actually, it's a very strong subject, and it's about hospitality's role in um, uh, human trafficking is one of her strong points she wants mm, to make wow. about that. Uh, they have a yeah I'm, that's why i'm like oh yeah heck yeah uh, please do um and so, so Lauren, she'll be on the could show. you possibly schedule that on a less vacation-y time so more viewers will see it because that sounds like a pretty important it's a, it's a very show. important yeah yeah it is very and now and and, and what i'll do for those so of you who yeah. may not have been following the last few black friday shows have been lauren <laughs> It's been made for continuity. That and Christmas Day are wonderful show times. Thank you. Uh, I'll be here. <laughs> but no, I would be happy to bring her back. She, that, she picked that date, to be honest with you. Okay. I don't know if it's because of her schedule concern or not, but she picked that date. Uh, I will be happy to have her come back at any time. Kat is a brilliant, brilliant woman. Uh, very talented. Uh, she and her partner, uh, well, partner, I say, but her coworker, Steve, uh, manager of education, handle all of Alhoa's training programs. And they're very wow. well-organized. Uh, very, uh, very diverse and uh, very well attended and very well represented. So they've done a great success with that. I mean, it's not her only topic, but I'm ensuring that she's on it. And I, I made sure that uh, uh, anytime she wants to bring that topic to to the conversation, she is always, always more than welcome to bring that conversation into, into the show. So and, um, and Ahoa has a new has a new CEO that was announced. Um, yeah, just announced. Yeah, new CEO yeah, that just rolled yeah, out from East Carolina University, which so. is impressive. And their new scope of business profile. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at their historical mission statements versus their new look and new directions, they are evolving. They are, uh, as they say, into the third generation of their growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, Education they're looking based, at right? different ways that they're looking at themselves within the organization and not trying to segment themselves as they had so much previously done before. They're looking at a broader scope. So congratulations to them. I was at their HX conference in New York just this week. And uh, the diversity of the content and the quality of the content was solid. I mean, I had the cybersecurity conversation, but I was just a moderator. So don't worry. There was actually good people talking about good stuff. <laughs> I just got to go. And you say, no, you know, I was, I tried to pull the Tim Peter, you know, draw out the, let them talk good. But anyways, I, with that next show, 224, this Friday, 1130 Eastern, 1030 Central. I hope um, all of you and any of you can make it back again. For those who watch this on the other platforms, uh, thank you. I apologize for the interruption between Simulcasting, pausing, then re-simulcasting. I changed laptops, so there was a little blip on uh, some of the platforms, but you can catch the entire show at the hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com, and I'll be rebroadcasting it out to the HSMA, uh, um, EU, and uh, APAC uh, regions on their schedule time this week as well, or next week, excuse me, next week as well. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for the participation. We'll see everyone next